Uh, thank you everybody for joining. This is the Data Science Zoominar from Dana-Farber Dana Cancer Institute. And today we are honored to have Natalie Dean come speak with us. She is a uh, professor in the Department of Biostatistics in the University of Florida. And um, she has been uh, keeping track of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic in many dimensions, but in particular, she is an expert in, in clinical trials and, and other uh, randomized trials, the analysis of data from randomized trials and the experimental design of these trials. So we've asked her to come and tell us a little about that today. So I'm gonna be asking her some questions and we're gonna be here for about half an hour and then we'll stop. If anybody has questions, you can go ahead and ask them. I will try my best to uh, get it to as many as possible, but it won't be that you know, everybody, uh, you'll see me looking to the side every once in a while. That's not me checking my email. That's me checking the questions coming from the audience. So um, feel free to ask. All right, so let me get started. So now during the pandemic, there has been um, a bit challenging for me at least, and I, I've heard from others to, to stay informed in part because it has been hard uh, for us to figure out who's an actual expert. And several people that we that speak with authority and confidence, uh, eventually, uh, at least I have decided, are simply just overconfident. Uh, and even those with correct credentials, I sometimes stop reading or listening to because it just doesn't seem like their their um, data or results match their confidence. Now, you're one of the few people that at least I have been I've continued to read and follow on Twitter and, and write what you have hear what you have to say. So what I want to start, my first question is, what makes you an expert? Thanks and so much for <laughs> Go ahead, go ahead. And if you want to share, if, I forgot to mention that if you want to share uh, slides, you, you can do that. Uh, there's a way to do it. I think we already figured all that out. So go ahead, sorry. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. So I was prepared for this question and I did make one slide, which is just to explain a little bit my background in infectious disease research. Uh, so you can guide guide the questions and then and then it also addresses this question too. So let me just share my screen very quickly. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So just briefly, um, what is my research experience that's relevant to uh, the COVID pandemic? So um, I've done a few different things. So one is survey design. Uh, so my so, so I'm a biostatistician, so some of, my, some of my PhD thesis was about designing representative surveys, so like multi-stage clustered stratified surveys, and using those to estimate things like prevalence of some sort of condition. I worked with the World Health Organization for a while with their HIV drug resistance group, designing surveys in low and middle income countries to estimate um, how well cl clinics for HIV clinics were functioning and to estimate levels of drug resistance. I worked I uh, led a technical working group with the WHO to design um, dengue sero surveys uh, to inform vaccination policy. Um, and then I've done some work with randomized trials. This is probably my biggest focus is I worked in, on an Ebola ring vaccination trial as it's described in the Lancet. We used an innovative strategy uh, during that pandemic to assess um, a new vaccine in a phase three trial and, and determined that it worked well and that's now being used and current Ebola outbreaks. Uh, since then, I've worked with the World Health Organization's Research and Development Blueprint for Action to Prevent Epidemics. And the focus of this working group is to figure out what we can do in advance of epidemics to be prepared to evaluate vaccines and therapeutics. So it focuses on a number of different diseases like MERS and SARS, um, but uh, in Zika and Ebola. Um, so any disease that can cause, a uh, set of diseases that cause outbreaks. I have an R01 for designing vaccine trials during outbreaks, and I'm currently working with uh, WHO's uh, Solidarity Multi-Country Vaccine Trial, planning the protocol for that. Um, I'm very interested in the use of core protocols, so these uh, lots of different groups contributing to one single trial so that we can uh, run these trials faster. Um, and then just briefly, I uh, my, my methodological interest also is um, uh, different vaccine study designs like the test negative design that's used for uh, to study flu vaccine effectiveness. 
I work with a number of groups that do a lot of modeling. We've done Ebola modeling, Zika modeling, and now with the group at Northeastern, uh, a number of different um, COVID-19 modeling projects. And then I also work on outbreak analysis. So um, I have a paper on Ebola transmissibility and severity. And then we have a paper that was just accepted at Lancet Infectious Diseases, analyzing contact tracing data from China. So basically I've been in this world of emerging infectious diseases for a while now, uh, well, for um, in infectious diseases for 10 years and emerging infectious diseases for six. So I'm very familiar with who are the people who are working in this area. Um, so that is my background. And then if you have follow up questions, so let me figure out how to stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great. So that's it. That's very uh, insightful. And I, I summon from that that you you know the people working in this area not just statisticians but others so that helps you figure out who's an expert and who isn't is that right or do you have other ways to yeah so I've always been on the border of, um, of biostats and then the infectious disease epidemiology so I work with a lot of people whose primary focus is infectious disease epidemiology so they're um, they're not in departments of statistics. They're in depart, you know, departments of you know infectious diseases or mathematical modeling, you know, groups. So I've been part of this network for a while. So I also know kind of who, who, who are the big players and who, um, and the, their different skills skill sets. Great. And and how? What do you make of, of outsiders coming in and and sharing their opinions and giving us advice, Nobel prizes and physicists and others? <laughs> I think it depends what kind of advice they're trying to give. I mean, if they're trying to kind of combine their expertise and, and add to, uh, to the epidemiology. So if people have insights about the economy or social sciences, you know, I think, or, or logistics, that can add a lot. When it's trying to sort of supplant and, and sort of assumes that there isn't this whole depth of research that has been going on for decades about infectious diseases and they can sort of do it better without having really studied the literature than that I'm less a fan of. Yeah, and what, now do you worry uh, about uh, some of this way of doing things, old ways of doing things, ossifying and maybe not moving ahead, not thinking creatively from, from, the, current, from the current experts? I think it's, you know, it, this is definitely going to force some change. It's, it's, uh, you know, where people are under a microscope and I think that's good. It will, you know, everything's much more transparent and people are digging into old code. And I think that that represents an opportunity for, um, yeah, for growth for everyone just to do better science. And then also to make sure that, you know, um, yeah, have, just find ways that more people can, can, give their input and offer a review and yeah, improve the quality overall. Great. Okay. So now can you give us a brief, brief summary of, of what's going on with the vaccine trials or, or the development of vaccines? I don't know if we have trials yet. There are trials. So there are like over a hundred vaccine candidates currently being developed and they use a number of different technologies. Um, there are some that are like RNA based, so they use the genetic code. There are some where they sort of recombine a, you know, a, a protein um, with, with, uh, with another virus. And then there are some where they're trying to like weaken or inactivate the virus. So some are sort of more classical technologies and some are more innovative and they're all being pursued in parallel. Um, there are, an, I'm not sure of the current numbers, but there are like at least eight vaccines that are in human trials right now. Um, uh, some of them are progressing even to phase two or, or there's one that's in phase three. Um, and so they're starting, I think in the UK, they're starting to enroll 10,000 people for, uh, to evaluate the Oxford vaccine. Um, so I'm working with the WHO on a multi-country vaccine trial. And the idea is to have a standing trial structure that um, that different vaccines products can enter into. And then there, through the WHO, there would be wide access to a lot of different sites. So the idea is to get as many sites participating as possible so that we can very quickly um, enroll 
enroll people, vaccinate people, and put the vaccine in the places where there's the most disease activity. So then that allows you to most quickly assess whether the product's working. I know NIH is pursuing a similar um, design just within the US, or at least that's my understanding. So, um, so I would expect to see these phase three trials starting pretty shortly within the next few months. Um, and, and products will continue to work their way through the pipeline and start moving into those, that phase three evaluation. So there is, there is some optimism there, not, if I hear from you, that um, we might be seeing something, you know, n not in the so distant future. I think we're set up to start evaluating products pretty quickly. I mean, if there's so much trans, usually one of the big challenges with phase three trials is that there's not enough transmission and you have to enroll a lot, a lot of people or mm. follow them for a very long time in order to distinguish between the two groups, the people who um, are vaccinated and the people who receive placebo. So to see if there's the vaccines actually protecting. But where, when you're in a situation where there's a lot of transmission in the community, then you may not need to wait as long, particularly if you can enroll big numbers mm -hmm. and you can put it in a, you can um, put the vaccine in a smart place. So some of what I'm interested in in, in my research is how you, uh, how, how you're innovative in where you place the trial and mm -hmm. how you can make the trial more flexible so that it can, um, so that you can, it can change with the epidemiology and you can put it where it needs to go. Yeah. I know Mark, so next week, next week, not next week, next Thursday, we have Mark uh, um, doing the Zoominar and he, I think he's, he has proposed using volunteers, infecting volunteers, which I guess is somewhat controversial, but um, I guess we'll, we'll ask him about that on Thursday. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> you have opinions about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's, it's important to pursue that work in parallel. I'm just not convinced that it's necessarily faster. Uh, just because it takes a long time to set those trials up. They can only be done in, um, they're probably only going to be done in younger populations. And we also want to know if the vaccine works in older populations. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to pursue that as another way to gather evidence. But uh, certainly it's not like a shortcut. I, I don't see it as a shortcut. Okay. So the next question is, if you can give us a brief summary of the trials for therapeutics and there is one question from Patrick Rusk uh, that's related, and he, he asks, it, well, I don't expect HCQ to be shown to have any significantly positive effect. Do you believe the recent Lancet study was well enough designed to warrant suspending the RCT underway with HCQ? So I'll ask you those two questions in one. Yeah, so I'll answer the second one first. So I, yeah, I'm not quite sure about that Lancet study. People, there's a lot of people who I trust are saying are suspicious of the of you know how the data could be collected and, and the numbers and you know it's just it's hard, there's a lot of data coming from Africa and it's, it can be difficult to I, I, I there's just people there's some suspicion so uh, certainly I don't you know, given that there's not enough transparency now about the source of the data I don't think it was sufficient evidence to discontinue a randomized trial and not all uh, there, the trials that have discontinued, I think, have felt under enormous public pressure, um, but not all of them have stopped. So, for example, there's a large trial in the UK, the recovery trial, and they did a, a safety analysis of their data, and they found no reason to stop. So, um, while I'm not convinced that the product is is effective, it, it you know it seems like a real long shot. Um, I'm not con also not convinced that it's as dangerous as that. I still think we should be collecting that randomized evidence. I still think there's uncertainty there. Um, yeah, the, so the status of those trials, there's, there are a number of large trials ongoing. There are also many small trials. Um, and I think, you know, what we'll see is, maybe we'll see some results from those, but also we'll see new products being added in, new treatments. And uh, what I'm looking forward to are um, the artificial antibodies, which are antibodies specifically designed for COVID. And um, the first ones are coming to trials now. And those seem more likely to work than some of the antivirals that are currently being studied. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. All right. So the, the safety and efficacy uh, evaluation for, for both vaccines and therapeutics are we use randomized control, control randomized trials. And I, I, 
I assume that they're like me, uh, you are, uh, you're an advocate for, for trusting these studies over anecdotal evidence and observational studies. But then there are circumstances where we have to use observational studies and the most, maybe the most famous example is smoking and, and cancer and, and lung cancer. But uh, still, for, in the case of cancer, there was a lot of studies, one after the other, confirming the results. And when it's just one or a handful of observational studies, then at least I, I'm always skeptical of, of, of these observational studies. So now, what, what is, I want to hear your thoughts on, on how we're using currently observational studies for some of the things that we're, that we're making policy on. For example, I, I think masks, maybe, there's only observational study and social distancing, as well as lockdowns. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about what are, what's the evidence out there for, for lockdowns in particular. I can see for masks and social distancing, there's, there's some biology that tells us it should work, very sort of intuitive, but maybe for lockdowns, it's maybe not as clear. And I don't know if you can tell us a little bit about what you know is out there in terms of observational studies that, that we can trust. Yeah, okay. There's a, so I guess I'll take the last part about the, the social, so well, lockdown seems related to social distancing, right? It's a sort of a more comprehensive. Well, so then, except it's the government um, making us do it. That's what I guess. Oh, okay. Uh, you know I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. I the lockdowns in particular, the 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 government forcing part. All right, I'm not. You know, it, that's a delicate that's a delicate um, policy issue, and so. Uh, but if you're looking for questions about the sort of the epidemiology, I mean, yeah, it's so, I mean, in the U.S., we've had different, different manifestations of these, these policies and, you know, and so they're, they're leaky in some ways. And I mean, definitely there's strong evidence that if you look at growth and, you know, there have been, it's done usually doing modeling studies that you mm -hmm. look at the rate of growth and then you see what happens after a policy is implemented and then you allow there to be some lag uh, acknowledging that there's, there's some time um, between when people are infected and when they start to really start to feel sick or show up at a hospital. And, you know, like it's pretty striking that the, that there is a big drop in um, the, the effective reproductive number after those policies are put in place. Um, but I think your question about this, where's the, evidence for the policies. I, what I'd like to see more of is, um, you know, I, I like randomized trials and I'm, uh, you know, I, what I'd like to see, but I don't know that they can be done on such a big scale, but I'd like to see them be done on smaller scales or at least proposed on smaller scales. Like for example, with school reopenings or business reopenings. And then, and then I think what the nice thing about proposing that is it forces you to compare, you know, identify an alternative that you, you would actually think there's equipoise or some reasonable, you know, you, you, if you want to say that gyms have to be closed or you want to reopen the gym, but you want to do, you know, like, can you, <laughs> can you really lay out an alternative? And even if you realize you can't go forward with that study, at least you've been very clear about what you're proposing. Like I've seen studies proposed for school reopenings in Norway that they, they didn't go forward, but at least they said like, the first phase is you open up at half capacity and the kids have to be this far apart. Second stage is you open up at three quarters capacity, you know, so at least you're laying out what you're looking for and what you're measuring. So I'd like to see more of, of that. Um, yeah, good. So that, that leads me to my next question, which is you, you mentioned that it's these epidemiological mechanistic models that are used to sometimes to make these decisions. And I, I've been looking at these models and looking at what they predict and what actually ends up happening. And I have to say, I'm not too impressed with the mechanistic models. Maybe it's because I don't understand them as well as, as I should. But I, I, and one of the places that where these mechanistic models, I think has, have failed to predict uh, is Sweden where, you know, there, there's no immunity yet. They're not locked down and they are, and it's not growing exponentially. I can, I'm gonna show you the, the plot as I looked up the data and I, 
uh, quickly made a it's pretty so steady. Can, yeah, let me show you so we can talk about the, the data uh, together. So you see it. So that's the that's the curve for Sweden. It has a, an immense weekend effect that that model I fit takes into account. So what I fit there is a Poisson with over dispersion, uh, and it has a week of the day of the week effect. And you can see the estimate and the standard error it does look like it is going down. So is there, um, so and let me show you now compared to, to other countries. So it has, so Sweden has been compared to, to other Nordic countries and it's doing pretty bad compared to those, but that seems a little bit like cherry picking. So I'm going to take the opposite, <laughs> the opposite and show you compared to Belgium and Massachusetts. And you can see that it doesn't look like it's doing worse than those two places. And of course there's a bunch of others that are better and some others that are worse. So um, I'll let you tell me what you think of Sweden. Like what's going on there? Why, why isn't it, why isn't the curve going up higher? Yeah. Okay. There's a lot in there. So yeah. So, I mean, Sweden, there are a lot of questions about Sweden. They've taken a different approach than other countries um, and have, have retained a lot more of the normal life than, than other places, um, you know, including keeping restaurants and open bars and there are rules, but you know, it's, it's, it's much different. Um, so I, you know, Sweden, so you say that comparison to the, uh, to other Nordic countries is, is cherry picking, but I mean, when we think about a counterfactual, you know, there, there are real similarities in the, the cultures there. Um, you know, Sweden's unique in that, uh, a lot of people live alone. And there's just, I, I just think that they're sort of naturally less predisposed for. So, um, so you do think, you do think that it isn't, that it, it is actually a better comparison to, to compare Sweden to Finland and Norway uh, and Denmark is, is, is a better comparison than say to Massachusetts and Belgium. That's because, because of the cultural, cultural differences. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's this, so the growth is is a function of you know among other things how people interact contact and you know how how densely people live and how how much they they interact with each other um if people are living alone then you're going to be natural that that place is less you know naturally going to be less likely to have as have as much growth um my question about Sweden is whether that curve's ever going to go down. Mm -hmm. um, and you put it up uh, again, so you can because you can see that. Let me put it up so people can see what you're talking I, about. But I think the down that we, you know, it's you have to disentangle a little bit. There are reporting delays, uh -huh. so it's not obvious to me so, yet. And I think what you're pointing out is that this, this, the slope of of, of Sweden is not as steep going down as yes. Massachusetts and Belgium. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. and so, so my question is, what are the, like, the proactive policies that are being put in place that will bring, can, can bring numbers down and, mm -hmm. um, and, and keep people safe? So the, Massachusetts is doing a very good job right now building, uh, you know, you're building okay. up content. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a human. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody's got some of that going on. <laughs> Um, uh, building up contact tracing and doing more testing. And so these, those policies are what are, are going to help, you know, locations stay safe longer, like into the future and, you know, prepare for the future. Because my concern about Sweden is that they're just going to hover along kind of, kind of flat for a while and without any, the same aggressive, you know, the proactive testing, tracing policies, it's just going to continue, you know, mm. And, and not and not go down um, I and I think it's a much further trajectory I think they're much further from building up the immunity that you would need to slow things down that way um, than they expect so I just I just feel like it's going to stay flat for a while I mean people are going to change their behavior if they're concerned um, and you know it, to a certain degree that's what people are doing they're staying home you know but um, but yeah I, I'm, I'm concerned it's just going to stay kind of flat Okay, so th but then isn't doesn't that same argument apply to Massachusetts now that we're at least we're opening up slowly, but it's going every week we have new things opening up. So it will 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 soon be like Sweden, and we also don't have um, complete immunity yet or whatever immunity we need to to, to keep the curve. Now. So I guess what would, what you're predicting is that we will have also another maybe another bump at some point. 
Yeah, I, I, there's going to be this, you know, we know more than we did before go, going into things. I don't think we're ever going to see this like really, really sharp growth because we know a lot more about what are the places where things transmit, you know, it t we're, we're trying to reduce the amount of activities that are indoors and crowded situ you know, crowded situations, close conversations, people are using masks. So I, you know, we're, we're taking more precautions than we did before. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think there, you know, there are going to be some, some bumps and, and then, and then it's going to, at the same time, we're working to build up the other systems like that contact tracing and making testing more accessible, easier. And that's what's going to allow us to, those are the things we wanted to have at the beginning, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. And as those get more efficient, then that can help balance that we want to keep, we want to open things up, but we want to have those other systems in place to balance them out. Oh, okay. I think we have time for one more. And this one's, I'm going to combine it with one from the audience. Um, so I want to talk about the IFR and I've heard numbers going from 0 .0, no, 0 0.2 to, to 1.4, I think. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and I want to hear what you, where you, where you think it is and what are the statistical challenges with computing it? Why, why it can't, why is it so all over the place? And I'm sorry to, to keep adding, but I also want to hear what you think about the Santa Clara story, which, which had one of the lowest estimate of via far. Um, and then from the audience on a related note, it says if possible, um, if to brief what is known on the results of different zero prevalence studies around the world compared to the specificity and sensitivity in each. So that's related to my question. So I'll let you finish our Zoom and our with, with answer to that <laughs> multi-part question. <laughs> okay, if I forget some parts, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so yeah, the, the infection fatality rate or ratio that the, the important thing there is that the denominator is the number of infections. Mm -hmm. And so that's not just the cases we observe. So it's necessary um, to do some sort of modeling or well, there's two, there's two options. One is some, you know, uh, you have to do some sort of modeling about what you think you're the, the best source is from these serial surveys really and so you're trying to use um, the antibody test to see how many people have been infected and then you can compare that to how many people have died within you know this the same same period so you're trying to get the denominator that way um, the you know I think there's become a lot of emphasis on this one number when really it's it's a it's a range. It's not you know it, we're we're trying to get sort of a, a sense and well, it's very different by age group by, by yeah you know, people who it's are susceptible. A, it's right. all it's, it's quite that's a bigger change than the actual range I gave you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so there's a lot of emphasis on this average as some sort of you know target thing, which it's useful. But we also have to remember there is big variability by by age and and that different populations are going to have different age structures, different comorbidities, also different quality of care, and that's going to drive the numerator. Um, and so you know, but can I interrupt real quick? Yeah, to, yeah. To make an argument for why I think it's it's good to have a good estimate of that, even if it's by, by age would be even better or by, by you know, maybe other covariates, uh, if you're asthmatic or, what, or whatever. Um, I, I think that the, if, you, if you're not a scientist and you can't read these papers, then you're, you're, re, you're watching the news and the news when someone young and healthy dies, it's like front page. And I, 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 at least I know, at least my family and friends are people that are freaked out and they're stressed and stress is also bad. So mm -hmm. just having the, if they knew, if I could convince them that, listen, it's not for, for you, the risk isn't as, as high, you, you don't want to get it because you want to spread it, but you shouldn't be freaked out the way you are. That's why I think it's, it's important to get that number. There's other reasons. But that's the one I, I, I think sometimes we forget. So go ahead. Keep. Yeah, yeah. Although on the on the flip side, I, there's still a lot of you know morbidity that we don't really understand. So I you know I want to know. Some people are saying that it wasn't that mild. Even the mild version wasn't that mild. So there's uh, there's yeah. still more more I want to see. Not you know. Um, yeah. I see what so, you're saying. That's a great point. That it, it's not just death. There's other. <laughs> yeah, there are other lose, things. You know, yeah. But yeah, but but basically, um, when I see new studies coming in, I. Uh, it, I really take them with a, a grain of salt. I, 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 you know, no, no one study is going to be the answer. You're kind of trying to triangulate 
and, and form a, a reasonable range and were, um, because each of them are gonna have biases in the, so the sensitivity and specificity of the test, um, that's gonna drive how well you can estimate that, that denominator of the number of people infected. And these tests are not perfect, uh, especially the rapid test, the, the pregnancy type tests. Um, so, so we have to, you know, we can make adjustments for that, but usually there's just a lot of uncertainty. And there's also can be some uncertainty in how deaths are reported or um, we, we, we might be missing some deaths. Um, so I basically, I just mm -hmm. interpret it as being an uncertain, you know, I'm just trying to establish kind of a reasonable range. Um, and I still think, I, I still think the range is, is kind of wide. Um, and so we can't really rule out that it might be closer to 1%. You know, um, if I had to guess, it's more like half, half a percent, but uh, I, there, I still feel like there's some, there's some uncertainty there. Great. Okay, well, it's 1.30, and um, this has been very informative, so I, thanks again for doing it. And yeah, we will be, we'll be posting the, um, we'll be posting the video online soon. Yeah, thanks, thanks again, sir. Natalie. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye.